Good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Great. I know we're running behind, so I'm going to just try to roll with this talk as best as I can. Um, my name is Pandy, and I'm super honored to be here. Um, you may know about me. I'm the Automation Panda. Uh, I'm not going to give a big introduction to myself because this talk will tell quite a bit about my story. Um, what I will say, though, starting off is that I love Python, and that's the starting point of why we're here to talk about surviving without Python. I first conceived this talk actually at last year's Pi Ohio, so it's only fitting that I get to give it here. So I want to take you back on a story. Oh, thank you. Mm. I want to talk to you about my Python journey. My Python journey actually started in high school. I was born and raised in Baltimore. I attended Parkville High School for math, science, and computer science. And in ninth grade, I got this lovely thing called a TI-83 plus graphing calculator. How many people had this thing? Oh, it was magical. Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? I taught myself how to program on this. First, it was math formulas, then games, and I just went crazy from there. As part of my high school program, I started doing C++ and then Java. And as a part of a survey course in 12th grade, senior year, I was first, it was my first encounter with Python. Back then, it was Python 2.7. It was really cool. I had a lot of fun with it. For some reason, I also ended up doing some COBOL. I don't just leave that off the uh, whatever. But <laughs> I had an amazing high school program. I, I really got into programming. And I did Python starting in 12th grade. And I promptly never went back until 2015, <laughs> nine years later. I, by that point, I was a software engineer in test, doing a lot of testing and automation. Uh, I worked at IBM. I worked at NetApp. I did four years of test automation in Perl. Don't do that. But then I got hired by this company called MaxPoint. Uh, if you, anybody been to Pi Data Carolinas, this Greg here in the front row is wearing the t-shirt. They were one of the sponsors for that. That was pretty cool. And MaxPoint was a, a three-language shop, C -sharp, Pyth C Sharp, Java, and Python. So I knew Java. Uh, C Sharp is basically Java. And then I was like, oh, Python is cool again. Let me try this. And I started using it heavily for my test automation there. It was awesome. I really, really fell in love with Python all over again, nine years later. Some of the things I loved about Python, I loved that it was easy to learn. I loved that it was concise, it was elegant, it was readable. It was command line friendly, so I could use it in Jenkins. It had packages for everything you could imagine. And, and, and can I mention PyTest? PyTest is awesome, especially for me being a tester guy. This is so cool. I could do amazing things in Python very quickly. I could write command line tools. I could just get things up and going. And it really brought me back to the joy of coding, right? And so I found out, oh, wow, I think I'm a Pythonista. <laughs> I think this is me. Oh, wow. So if you may have heard this term before, but the basic definition of a Pythonista is a person who loves the Python programming language. And I was like, this is th it me. I love this. I, I absolutely love to use Python. It's so easy. It's so fun. I feel like I can do so much with so little verbiage. And so yeah, I, I self-identified as a Pythonista. And that was great until 2016. <laughs> uh, things happen. You know, software is tumultuous. I ended up leaving that company for a greater opportunity elsewhere. But as part of that job transition, I ended up no longer doing Python as part of my day-to-day -day work. And so, hence the inspiration for this talk, I had to end up surviving without Python. Mm. But there's a hard truth here, and that's the fact that there's more to the software world than just Python, right? We're, we're here at a Python conference, and we probably go to other Python conferences, and we do our Python talks, and Python, 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 because we're Pythonistas, right? But there is, there's more to software than just Python, right? It's, it's not the one-stop solution for everything. There, there's, a bit, there's a bit of a bubble that we need to pop around ourselves. And it's regardless of frameworks, languages, packages, domain, or speciality, right? And I have evidence to back this up, right? Back, or this year, earlier this year, Stack Overflow did a developer survey. I don't know if anybody took it or saw the results. Um, Python had a very strong showing of uh, the po most popular programming, scripting, and markup languages. You can see Python was rated at number four at 41%. Uh, but it is not the number one. JavaScript is dominating that game for better or worse. And there are still other languages like Java and C Sharp. They tend to dominate backend systems. Uh, R and Scala, though they're not as high in the rankings, they were farther down the list, particularly for like data science and work. 
Uh, JavaScript is all over the front end. So different domains have different languages that are strong in those areas. It's not just languages, but it's also things like frameworks. If you look at web frameworks, it should be no surprise that JavaScript is all over the top. Our beloved Django and Flask make a showing, but they're way, way down, right? So there's a good chance if you're doing web development, you're going to end up not doing Python, or you're going to do Python along with something like JavaScript. And just straight up any type of framework, whether it's web or not, um, again, Python frameworks like Pandas and TensorFlow make a strong showing, but they're not the only ones out there. Right? There's some C-sharp things, and there's some .NET things, and there's JavaScript things. So we live in a very interesting world with very diverse technologies, languages, tools, and frameworks. So if you're in this tech space, you, like me, you may end up working on non-Python projects. And that's OK. And I'm here to tell you, it's going to be OK. So, let's, so the question then becomes, as Pythonistas, how do we survive without Python? How are we going to live and work and breathe and enjoy what we do if we don't get to use our favorite language or a language or technologies or frameworks that we love? And so my answer to that is, even if we don't use Python for everything, we can still take inspiration from Python's principles, projects, and people. And we can apply that to whatever we are working on to make things great. So let's start off by talking about principles. When I say principles, I'm talking about the principles that come from the Zen of Python. Um, for y'all who may not know, um, the Zen of Python is a set of guiding principles for the design and implementation of the Python language. Uh, it's a, there's an Easter egg in the interpreter. If you go to a command line and you type import this, it'll dump the Zen of Python in 20 points. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure probably everybody's seen this. Uh, recently, uh, Adrian Lowe gave an awesome talk about this, so I definitely recommend check that out out on YouTube. <clears throat> but let's look at three in particular that I think can apply well to other spaces. The first point that I love is beautiful is better than ugly. Right? Beautiful is better than ugly. There's an aesthetic to the Python programming language, and there's an aesthetic to how we go and write Pythonic code. Right? It's not my quote, but it's out there. Code is art that does something. I don't know if anybody's heard this before. This, this, this resonates very much with me. It's like, oh, yes, code is art that does something. We should take pride in the work that we do, whether we're writing some test cases or whether we're developing a web front end or whether we're doing some back end systems or we're analyzing data systems, setting up pipe, whatever the thing is. We, we are craftsmen and craftswomen. We should take pride in our work because we are creative beings. Right? We're all here learning about the thing that we're doing because we love doing it in some sense. Nobody's forcing us to do this kind of work. Right? Well-formed utterances of logic and reason bring order to solutions out of the chaos of problems. Right? We're solution bringers. We're solution makers. There are problems in the world. I need to set up this pipeline. I need to solve this really tricky thing that's affecting people's lives. How can I do that? By the power of software. Right? We can use the powers of logic and reason as we make our code to really solve good problems and bring about good solutions. And th this is very much art, right? We use technology and we go through a process of engineering. But a lot of times the formation of these solutions and how we implement that really comes down to an art, right? And so this, this art that we apply to solution bringing and problem solving is language independent. We can do this in Python. We could do this in Java. We could do this in any language that's available, right? Beautiful is better than ugly. I really first learned this lesson when I was in high school, at Parkville High School. In 10th grade, I took a Java course. And it was really cool because I got to kind of, it was, I got to treat it almost like an independent study where I just, just cramming through all the examples in the textbook and have a fun time. And I remember, uh, I forget when it was in the course, but there was a lesson on recursion. I'm sure, how many people have hit recursion and broke their brain over it? Yeah, it's one of those things. It's like, you, okay, you've learned basic programming, hello world, you've done the conditional statements and loops, and you've probably done a little bit with classes and lists and arrays. Okay, now recursion. Let's just, boom, right? A function calling itself. How is this going to work? Oh my gosh, am I blowing my stack, right? It, it was really challenging for me at, as an early you know, programmer trying to wrap my head around this. But my textbook had this incredible activity for teaching recursion, and it was this thing called the Coke curve. I don't know if anybody's seen this before. But the idea is you have a line, and then you put a, a triangle on the middle of it, 
and you keep breaking down the segments and keep making little triangles on top of those. And if you arrange three of these lines and do this algorithm recursively, you'll get this beautiful picture of a snowflake. Isn't this cool? Right? It's kind of recursive. It keeps adding up and going, and there's all sorts of fun. And so I'm like, wow, that, that snowflake looks pretty cool. But look, look at the algorithm that makes this snowflake. Like, it's, it's just recursive calls. You, if you hit your base case, you stop. But otherwise, you, you determine your length side is going to be a third of what it was before. And you go straight, and you turn left, your recursive call, you make it go straight again, you turn right again. And th this is the code. This is, now, I did it in Java originally, but this is a, a Python version of this code. And, and the thing that really struck me, and I'm so glad I hit this like, life lesson in 10th grade at the very early point of my programming career, what I found was beautiful was not so much the snowflake, but the algorithm. Right? I saw beauty in the algorithm, that it made sense, that it was so elegant and simple. And the fact that the snowflake is beautiful is a side effect of the algorithm being beautiful. And that blew my mind. Right? I was like, wow, that's amazing. When you do things well and you craft it well, good things happen as a consequence. And I, that, just, that just invigorated me so much more to be like, this is an amazing thing. We can use the metaphysical building blocks of logic and reason, the underpinnings of our very universe, to make awesome things happen. Right? And I knew from that moment, I wanted to pursue this kind of thing for my life. Right? Beautiful is better than ugly. So let's take pride in our work. Let's make sure we're making awesome things. Right? And that can apply to anything. <clears throat> Another tenet of the, the Zen of Python is simple is better than complex. Right? Simple is better than complex. If we can do things simply, it's going to be better for everybody around. Right? Now, how do we read a file? Well, you write some code and you read the file in and it's in memory. Right? Here's a Java implementation of reading a file. This code is kind of ugly. Now, it may be a little bit unfair because there's some improvements in the Java language that make this a little bit simpler, but historically, you'd have to like read an input stream and do a buffering and like read it with a loop and do all this kind of trimming and stuff and then close it. It's very, very complicated. I think you're probably looking at this right now like, oh my gosh, this is what people do in Java. Yes, this is what people do in Java sometimes. Sorry, Java, I love you, but sometimes it hurts, right? How would we write this in Python? Wow. True story. I'm not making this up. It's the same kind of stuff, right? Simple is better than complex. When we have fewer lines of code, we have simpler calls, it's going to make our, our ex development experience better. It's going to make the product better. It's going to improve maintainability. It helps lower the bar so other people can come in and contribute as well. These are the kind, this is the kind of code that is objectively better, I would say, right? So this was like a simple construct of a, a particular thing, a small thing, common thing, loading a, or reading a file. But how can we apply this idea of simplifying our code to other languages that may be more verbose than Python? There's a few things we can do. And I do this every day in C Sharp because for some reason, for the past three years, I'm a .NET developer. <laughs> like I tell people this, you go to all the Python conferences, you're a .NET developer? Yes. Really? Are you, you're, this is a joke, right? No, it's actually not a... Anyway, it's not a bad thing. It's cool. But hey, so... How can we write Pythonic code in other languages? Um, things like writing small functions and methods instead of big ones, right? Using short lines instead of very long chains. Uh, using line continuations for rather lengthy strings. Uh, avoiding unnecessary curly braces. Maybe that's just a pet peeve of mine, but uh. uh simple loops and list comprehensions rather than nested down the wazoo, right? These are all very Pythonic things that we know is, Python encourages you as a language to adopt these better practices. But it doesn't mean you can't do them in other languages as well. Oh my gosh, I mean, I overlooked that. I just take it for granted, right? Yeah. So bingo, bingo. <laughs> a third thing from the Zen of Python that I like to highlight is readability counts. Right? And this hits home for me, because not only am I a software engineer, but I'm a software engineer in test. That means the main focus of what I'm developing are test automation solutions. <clears throat> so if we look at the domain of software testing, we, we really got to recognize that readability leads to understandability and leads to maintainability. Right? In software testing, we want to describe our behaviors using plain language. And we know our test cases are going to cover those behaviors. 
and our automation is going to implement those test cases. So I want to make sure that backtracking from my script to the test to the behavior of which I'm testing, that should all be very intuitive. Right? I shouldn't have to look at a test script and wonder, how the heck did I end up with this? In Python, this is pretty nice. right? Uh, PyTest. I love PyTest. Who loves PyTest? Oh, I, yes, thank you. You warm my heart and soul. I gave a tutorial on this. I went to talks yesterday on PyTest. It's just the best thing ever. Um, I can write tests in PyTest, right? It's great. I can write web UI tests in PyTest. In fact, this is a, a snippet from my tutorial from yesterday, right? In my test cases that I write, I can, I can add helpful comments to show exactly what I'm doing. I can use design patterns like page objects to describe, hey, I'm going to go to a search page. I'm going to load the page. I'm going to search for something. I'm going to go to the results page and check things on that page. Very intuitive, very readable. Um, I can also write my tests in a behavior-driven development style, if anybody's heard of that, using a language called Gherkin. Has anybody heard of Gherkin? Yeah, I live in Gherkin land. That's my life. I do that in C Sharp instead of Python. But on the right, I've written the same test that's on the left, but I've written it as a Gherkin feature file. And this is all plain language. Given the DuckDuckGo homepage is displayed, when the user searches for Panda, then the results are shown. Right? So this idea of readability is rather universal. It's, not, it's a hallmark of Python, but it doesn't have to be only for Python. Right? When I write my tests, I write them in Gherkin. And then I have C-sharp automation code underneath that'll implement each line by line step. So readability counts. Readability is a good thing. And we can apply that outside of the Python space. Is everybody tracking with me here? Yeah, cool. So now that we've talked a lot about principles, let's move on to our next P, because P's are for pandas, P's are for pythons, and P's are for the three points of our slides. Yes, projects. Projects can use Python in cool ways, even if it's on the side, right? Like I said, my main project at my company, I develop a test automation solution in .NET using Specflow and Slimming WebDriver. We have a full web UI test solution that runs way too many tests every day, continuously, overnight, right? Right, so that is, that's what you would call my main product. My main project, and my main product is a C-sharp solution. But I can still use Python elsewhere, and so can we, right? <coughs> Last year at PyCon, Larry Hastings gave a really cool talk called Solve Your Problems with Sloppy Python. The thesis of his talk was this, right? Python is great for quick and dirty things. If you need to write a script once to do some task and then throw it away, that's totally cool. It doesn't matter if it's not the best practices for your code. Did it get the job done and you moved on with your life? Cool, good enough for some things. Things like if you need command line tools or you need to make a text or data munging script because you gotta load like a gigabytes of data once into a system and that's it. Or if you wanna do something like rapid prototyping, Import this, import that, import everything you can imagine, slap it all together, and boom, you have a product, right? Python's great. So even if, the pro even if Python may not be the main technology for a product, it can still help you get there, right? Keep that in mind. And if you want to learn more about things that Python can do, particularly in the world of automation, um, I recommend reading these books as well, right? If the product is not written in Python, then maybe its support can be. Maybe your test cases for your web app can be written in Python. Maybe you can do some sysadmin scripts to help you out, right? Python can help. <laughs> and maybe it's not a project at your day job, but maybe you're moonlighting on something. Fun fact, did you know I once owned a suit and dress tailoring business? I live an interesting life. It's strange but true. How did this work? Well, what we would do is we would meet customers here in the US. We would take their measurements. Yes, I had to take people's measurements. Yes, it got awkward at times. It's cool. Take their measurements. They pick out their materials, their style points. There's so much that goes into these suits. Oh my gosh. If you need a tailor making suit, I could just belabor all the details about this all day, but we're not here for that. We would do this. Then we, we would send all these things off to Shanghai and China, and we would have them made by expert tailors who've been doing this for years and then import the suits back into the US to final fitting and everybody's hopefully happy or they're angry because it didn't come back right. Let's not talk about this, right? Now you might be wondering, Andy, why are you taking this, this side trip talking about suits? This is a Python conference. Well, business problems get software solutions. <laughs> How did I solve the business problems? By the power of Python and specifically with Django. For all of our order processing, I built a Django web app, right? Because there were there's customer data, there were measurements, there were orders that had to go in, we had to track status as orders are in the pipeline. 
right? So I built a web app in Python to solve all these business problems. I threw out my data models. I used the admin site. There was no real front end because myself and my wife and a few other partners were the only ones who logged in. So I used the admin site as basically our, our admin console login for order processing. I hosted it on Heroku. It was awesome. Um, stored our customer data in a Postgres database, stored our pictures and images in Amazon S3. Um, and here's a really cool part. You put it in order, you click a button, you would download a receipt with all the details given to the customer. You click another button, you download the receipt, and it's automatically translated into Chinese. And we would send that, excuse me, we would send that off to the tailors in Shanghai. My wife is from China, by the way, hence this whole hookup. But like for each individual order, she would spend like half an hour translating from English to Chinese by hand, in addition to all the problems of you didn't get this measurement or that measurement, right? I took that half hour and eliminated it down to like a split second. I'm pretty proud about that. That was a pretty cool trick. So, and also it also did some, some calculations on the back end. So I used Python to solve that very real problem we had. And that was just something that, you know, was a side business, right? Now that business is no longer operating. Thank goodness I get some time back. But if my plans were to take it to a next step is, well, I could have just made a, a front end for that and had customers just go online and place orders there. And if I had done that, I would have done a hybrid thing where I was looking at using Angular for my front end, making a Jangular app, right? So Python can work with other frameworks. I didn't make this term up, it's out there, Google it, right? But the thought is like Python can work with other things. Like we saw JavaScript is, is dominating popularity out there. We'll see how long that lasts. JavaScript, love it or hate it, it's there, right? But Python, if it, if it can't be in the front end of the browser, though some things may make that change, it can work with things like JavaScript. Or maybe you use Django REST framework, or you use Flask instead of Django, or you use React or Vue.js, right? Python can work with other things too, all in the project space. Finally, I like to talk about people. And this is my favorite part. People build strong, healthy community. And we're all here at Pi Ohio. I'm assuming we're having a good time, right? I love Python conferences. Yeah, y'all love them too, right? You're here because of community. Or maybe you're here for the language, but what you're going to find out is you're also going to be here for the community, right? But it doesn't, good community doesn't have to be limited to Python, right? And we'll see how. So raise your hand if any of these bullet points has been true for you. You got stuck on a programming problem. You struggled to understand a concept. You felt alone, isolated, imposter syndrome. You wanted to give up. I'm going to turn around and let's see. Everybody's hand is raised. That's not surprising, right? Was anyone there to help you all out? Yeah, that's why you're here now. Woo! Thank those people. We just had a keynote on that, right? That's the basis of community. That's why we come to these things and help each other out. It's awesome, isn't it? Yes, it's awesome. It's frequently said, people come to Python for the language but stay for the community. And that was very much true of my story, right? I had no reason to, to really engage the Python community after I had left that one employer in 2016. But it's, it's 2019, right? I think so, yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm giving talks about this. It's amazing, right? I think what really helped me engage the Python community was I went to PyCon 2018. That was, I had been to Pi Data Carolinas before, but I, I wasn't really like in the community at that point. This PyCon 2018 was like the first time I really was like engaging the community. I already had a language I loved. I'd already built this Django app and done a ton of testing, but now it's like, okay, let me, let me try this thing out. So I went, I saw the Django girls and I thanked them for their awesome documentation for helping me solve tailoring problems, right? I met the founder of PyBytes or co-founder Jason or uh, Julian. I met a friend from RIT and I scored so much swag, <laughs> right? And I had an amazing time. It, it was so inspirational. I mean, I wrote whole blog posts about like all the wonderful things that happened. I wish I had more time here in this talk to talk about it, but I gotta move on. Come talk to me afterwards. But that started this crazy thing of Pandy Nights World Tour. Um, I went to, from PyCon to Pi Ohio, to Pi Gotham, to PyCon Canada, to Pi Caribbean, to Pi Texas, and then finally back to PyCon 2019, um, and then, of course, well, here, this is the next one. But PyCon 2019 for me felt more like a reunion because with these amazing conferences, I had met so many amazing people. Many of them are here in the front row. Thank you. Um, that it was just like, wow, I feel like I belong. And so PyCon 2019 was just phenomenal. 
And like all these people are people I've met along the way. Each one of these is an expert at something amazing. Many of them are here in the audience today to listen to my talk because they support me. We had a road trip from Raleigh, North Carolina as the Pi Carolinas delegation to be here at this conference. That's how awesome this community is, right? There's, a, there's some guy, whoa, yes, yes. Like this photo was taken at Edinburgh a year ago today. That's my friend Julian when we meet up. He's from Australia, by the way. He came a long way, right? That's Pi Texas. That's the Pi Carolinas um, open space. This is the announcing of all the different conferences. That's a guy who's also from Raleigh. That's just the Pokemon company. They were there. I love Pokemon. So there's amazing things are happening in this community. And so I want to make it clear. Conference friends are real friends. And it's amazing the things you can do. And it's so amazing, I'm trying to make this happen in Carolina. <laughs> I love it so much, I'm trying to get a Pi Carolinas 2020. It's probably going to be in June in Raleigh. A lot of people are helping out. Um, help me make it happen, get on Slack and all that stuff. But all that to say, right, this doesn't have to be exclusive to Python. This is something Python is very good at doing, but you can take it to your own communities. You can take it back to your tribes, as our keynote speaker said, to your workplace, to your open source projects, to your other languages and technologies and groups and all that, right? What we've done in Python doesn't have to stay in Python. And that's, a one, that's how we can survive without Python. We can take the awesome things, the principles, the projects, the people, and take them elsewhere. So my, 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 my challenge to all of you, TLDR, be inspired to do great things. Thank you very much.